I want to share something with the church family that is not the message, will be shorter than the message, might be more important than the message. Uh, we had somebody in our church family who unfortunately he passed away this past week. Uh, his name was Tony Nelson. And um, I felt like I should share a little bit about Tony because it, whew, it grips my heart when I think about his life. His life, his name was Tony Nelson. Does anybody, I'm not, I'm not trying to... Mm, like call you out if you don't know the name, but I just want to illustrate a point, a point that I think could help all of us. How, how many people by name know who Tony Nelson is? We've got about half a dozen people here who know who Tony Nelson is. And um, how many people, more hands go up? Uh, maybe. Tony was the guy, maybe you were here for that service, when the middle of the message, the middle of the message, he was like, I have a question. And uh, how many people remember that? Raise your hand if you were here for that. So that's Tony. And in that moment, I said, Tony, we love you, brother, but, but stick around afterwards and I'll answer any questions you might have. And um, <laughs> he stuck around. I was kind of caught up here. It's been a while. And I saw him in the back row and he came up afterwards. And, and I said, dude, all right, this is the best time to ask a question. He said, I forgot. I forgot what it was. Um, most of us don't know his name, but you need to hear me really clearly. He was a big part of this church. <sighs> Sometimes there's a lot of noise about a lot of things that go on at church. And to me, if we're not caring for people like Tony, all the rest of the stuff is just noise. And my opinion, my view, I get it when people are like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to feel like, Where's my place at Castle and all that stuff? I get it, and then at a certain point, I stop getting it because actually there's people like Tony Nelson who walk through this church every single week. And Tony, he died of an overdose. It was a fentanyl overdose. Fortunately, that's what got him at the end. But uh, Pastor Dave Holland was the one who reached out to me to tell me that Tony Nelson uh, had died. I said, no way. I know Tony. We've known Tony since the day this church opened. Now maybe some of you are starting to pick up, maybe not by name, but you know him uh, by face, and you're starting to think of who he is. During the week when I'd be popping in and out of here at church, I'd see Tony all the time. and I'd see him either over at El Rancho or walking up and down these streets. And, and I've known him, even going back to the old church, I've known Tony. And I knew him by name. Get to know people, church. Get to know people by name. Get to know their stories. And let that be your theology that's greater than any other theology you got. Is that you're going to love people who come in and, here, in and out of here because they're fighting stuff that are really powerful. And what, he, what Dave Holland told me was this. He said, I was just having lunch with him the other day. And Tony was talking about how much he loves Castle. Just imagine for a second. 90% of us can't even call his name out. But he loved this church. And then Dave texted me yesterday, and he said, actually, as a matter of fact, he was talking to his mother about me the day before he died and about our church family. And I just want to emphasize, emphasize, I, I, I knew Tony enough to be like the last, he was here just recently, he grabbed, sometimes he just grab his coffee and be like, it's enough church for me, <laughs> and leave. You know what? I'm so fine with that. Um, and he would grab his Coffee leaf, but I knew him enough to know that the other day when he was walking by with a friend, somebody, I shouldn't say, I don't know who he was, uh, he, he was, he was struggling because he didn't want to make eye contact. You kind of just pick up on where somebody's at. Well, that was Tony. And can I just remind us all, I want to hear you all, like I do when I preach sometimes, I want to all hear you say amen in a second. I just want to remind you of what the vision's really about. It's about bringing the gospel not to big crowds, but to the next person in front of you. And because somebody's going to slip in and out of here while we're having conversations about this thing and that thing, and I'm worried about this thing and that thing, do I fit in and what is this about and how is this about? Come on, church, just say hello to somebody and show them a little bit of the love of Jesus. And that little bit of showing them the love of Jesus can fuel them for the longest time in their battles. And I'm glad that Castle Church is open in downtown Norwich so that we can be a host to people like Anthony Nelson. And may we all do that together as a church. Can we say 
Amen to that. Okay, you know what? I'm going to have you get up on your feet while I read this verse. Everybody up on your feet. I don't know. It just feels like you need it. I'm going to read two verses in Psalm 89. And uh, from there, go into the third part of our series on Explore More. Okay, so this is, these are the verses. Blessed, I'm going to read the whole verse and come back to a couple words. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. That's Psalm 89, 15 and 16. If you were to go back, who have learned to acclaim you, that's another way of saying worship. Worship is more than just a song. But then we have some beautiful worship this morning. Don't take that for granted at all. We had some beautiful worship. Learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence. The message is about the presence of the Lord, and the way I'm going to kind of put that together is having a deeper relationship with God, because that's what I believe we're here for. They rejoice in your name, your name being his reputation. His reputation being, how many of us can say this morning that we worship God because we know that he is good? His, his goodness, and they celebrate your righteousness. All right, I want to call all of us into agreement. We don't usually do stuff like this. Can we do? I, I'm doing something a little bit new, a little bit new. It's an affirmation. Let's do some affirmation. Affirmations together, coming into agreement. I'm going to say three things. I'm going to ask you to repeat them with me, okay, for those of you who would like to. If those of you who would not like to and like to listen, that's okay to listen to. But the three things we're going to say together. I am here to learn about following Jesus. That's one. I'll get to, I'll come back to it, I'll come back to it. Sorry, I don't lead this very well, but it's my first time doing it too. Uh, I am here to learn about following Jesus. The second thing we're going to say is, I have what it takes to grow in my faith. And the third one is a long one, so if you can say it all, you get a prize at the end. It says this, I don't have to be 100% to have 100% of Jesus. Okay? Let's do this. First thing is, I am here to learn about following Jesus. Not bad. You'd like, some of you took a while to get there, but we got it. I'm here to learn about following Jesus. Second one, I have what it takes to grow in my faith. I have what it takes to grow in my faith. And now the third one, we'll put it up in two. We'll slow down at the first half and then finish it up. I don't have to be 100%, I don't have to, be 100%. to have 100% of Jesus. To have 100% of Jesus. All right, that works. Let's all sit down. Let's all sit down. We can take our seats. When I go on my tri- uh, a trip, like I just did, and actually wherever I go, I got like a little file of notes, and every now and then I th- just put something in there. And like when I feel like God is speaking to me, and recently it was, I don't have to be 100% to have 100% of Jesus. When we're not at 100%, we start feeling like we got to make up the difference. Jesus is already the difference. We, we've got to, if we're going to get deeper in our relationship with Jesus, which is what we're here for, if we got to get deeper in our relationship with Jesus, we have to be those who understand that going deeper in our relationship is not just behaviors. It's not just outward stuff. Christians who go deeper in their relationship with Jesus don't just water the leaves, they water the soil. You can have, all the leaves can have the water on them, but if the soil isn't getting the nutrients that it should get, then we start to wilt, even if it looks like it's getting what it needs. So how many of us want the soil to be saturated with the Holy Spirit as it begins to cause us to grow? Amen? So, so we need him to do that in our lives. And uh, I, a while back, I read a book by Dane Ortland. Dane Ortland, a couple of us uh, were gracious enough uh, to join me in reading the book, but it was about the gentle and lowly heart of Jesus. And it it was life. Every now and then you read something you just never forget. And for me personally, I just see that the number one thing about Jesus that he said about himself was his gentle and lowly heart. Well, anyway, Dave Ortland came back with another book called Deeper. And, you know, I'm preaching kind of topically here. I gave you the verse. We're talking about the presence of the Lord. But I, I'm trying to expand some ideas with us as a church as we grow in our relationship with him. 
And he says, if we had that slide up, Dane Ortland says that he makes a case that sanctification, the process of becoming more and more like Jesus, doesn't just happen by doing more or becoming better, but by going deeper into the wondrous gospel truths that washed over us when we were first united to Christ. Now, I just want you to think about that for a minute. For, for me, for me, as I've gotten deeper in my relationship with Jesus, it's, it's not like I found out this, it's not like I went to the moon and back. I just, whatever I got in Jesus, I know so much more about now. And so when I first found Jesus, and I was 15 years old, and the, even the people who led me to the Lord weren't, I mean, they, so I tell people I got baptized in dirty water. And it just doesn't matter at the end of the day because it, it's not about the people. It's about who Jesus, what Jesus did for me. And there's a lot of people who've been through church life who've been baptized in dirty water, but they got baptized and they started a relationship with Jesus. And I was 15 years old. And when I tell you the grass was greener and the sky was bluer, it was. Can anybody think back and thank Jesus for the moment? This is the most amazing moment in a human being's life. It's when they are overwhelmed by the fact that Jesus Christ loves them unconditionally. And that moment when somebody realizes they are loved because of the good news of the gospel, because the goodness of God leads us to repentance. I was like, Lord, you love me. You know my name. I was, I was put on this earth with a purpose, and the love of God just overwhelmed me. Anybody else relate to that? You're all too quiet for relating to something like that. That's being such good news. Too quiet today. Just too quiet. And I'm going to make you clap awkwardly when I feel like it's too quiet. quiet. Because... I, you know, for those of you who are kind of coming in and out of the church and getting to know the church, very easy to have a honeymoon, honeymoon phase in any relationship. I tell people straight up that we're still in pioneering days. It's going to be seven years. Uh, and, you know, maybe people are here for a season, but really the real relationships begin when the honeymoon phase ends and we start to do a life together. And I'm so grateful for people in this church that we're doing life together with. But it's the same with Jesus. Sometimes people get this honeymoon relationship with him, but the Bible says it's like seeds that don't, you know, where the, where's that seed going? Because the cares of this world choke it out. Don't let the cares of this world choke out what is the most amazing thing in your life, and that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the love that I first experienced at 15 years old now my life, all these years later, it's a deeper understanding of what that love actually means. You know why? Because there's been a lot of days where I didn't know how to love myself. There's been a lot of days when I messed up. There's been a lot of days when I've been hurt by other people. There's been a lot of days filling all the blanks. But in all those days, Jesus Christ has loved me faithfully. And that is caused me to stand on something, to stand on God in a way that I don't think I could have imagined back as a teenager. Because back then, certain things would hit me, and I would kind of fold. But I'm growing, by God's grace, into a deeper relationship. That's what the prayer is for all of us here at Castle Church. Can we say amen to that? Just a deeper relationship. The same truths that we were saved and we get deeper and deeper into us. How many people understand, like you heard about mercy, but then when you experience mercy, you're like, that's on another level. Can we say amen to that? How many people can say that you heard about this word grace, but then when God gives you grace and empowers you to do what's right, and, and it's more than just I'm trying to do right because I'm afraid that I'm going to mess up. Grace is not fear-based. Grace is love-based. And so when you are not just operating to please a religious set of rules, I grew up this way, I'm expected to do this way, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. That's not relationship. Relationship is, Lord, I want to do the things that please you because you have shown me mercy. And if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for you, how many could put, put your hands up and say, if it wasn't for Jesus? If it wasn't for Jesus. I'm going to say three things about getting that deeper relationship and walking in the light of his presence. I have some framework, a framework moment for you, okay? 
a framework moment to kind of set the, what, what this isn't about, about the deeper things of Jesus. I feel like in this country, in American Christianity, we, we do this. God is mysterious, and so should God's people be hard to figure out. God's people, should, just follow me on this, God's people shouldn't be that hard to figure out. The only thing that should be hard to figure out about God's people is they're going through a trial and they're trusting in something bigger than themselves. That's what should make people say, wow, I want to know about them. But not some of the stuff, you know, that we do in American Christianity where we begin to complicate and make things complex and we use more and more insider language and we talk about dominion theology and this and that and we talk about spirituality, spiritual things in high places and if you can't tell somebody what you're praying about, then maybe what you're praying about isn't the thing you should be praying about because it should be plain and open. Jesus says, I did everything. He, he, he said to the disciples, don't put your light under a bushel, but cause your light to shine. When Paul was under trial and before King Agrippa and he was being blasted, he would finally turned to the king and said, I don't know what the problem is. Everything I did was in the open. I didn't do it in a corner. And I'm trying to guide this church in a sense of away from corners and weird, complex, overly thought out doctrines and dogmas. It reminds me of the Good Samaritan. It was the, it was the, the Levite and the priest and two people walked by one person then the next and they're full of theology but their hearts are cold as ice because theology is rooted in people god loving people and this man who's bleeding on the street their theology should have said i don't care about all that i don't need another meeting with somebody i don't need to talk about this and that i need to sit down with this person until this person can get up and walk in until he gets whole and so for us as Christians, the idea is for us not to be in shade, but to be out in the light. When we talk about having a deeper relationship with Jesus, it's growing deeper in the things that we all know about. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, not secret type things where the culture's way out there and we're, we're way behind walls, but that we understand it's not just this mysterious end times theology. It's really, truly, real, concrete, practical. This is how I'm going to love my neighbor. And honestly, the more you get into a relationship with Jesus, he will blow your mind plenty. There's parts about God that's supposed to be mysterious. But let God's people be transparent. Can we say amen to that? Not hard to figure out. Can we say amen to that? Basically, what I'm saying is stop weirding people out and just... Just walk in the light. Walk in the light. My life is transparent. I'm, a, I, I'm praying about stuff. I can tell you what I'm praying about. I ain't going to take a thread from the Old Testament to the New Testament and start turning it into something it's not. Because really, for me, theology begins with Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross in his actual hands. When Thomas was doubting, you know what he needed to see? He said, I gotta see, I gotta see your hands. And the, the nails, the nail scars in his hands. That's what we need, church. We need a church that's filled with Jesus to the point where we know how to love people the right way. There's three things I want to tell you about, about deep Christians. So when I say deep Christians, are we all on the same page? I don't mean like hard to figure out, mysterious Christians, you know, elite Christians, just real life practical Christians. But how do we get deep? There's a couple of things. As we're walking in the light, as we're growing in the presence of Jesus, deep Christians are those who walk through the valley of suffering, found Christ there, and now they got something to say about it. There's some things you're never going to know about God. Mm, I got to say this to you until you suffered those things. Can we say amen to that? Amen. What did Job say? Job said, I lost it all. Right? It's, it's, talk about a complex story. I lost it all, Job. I heard about God. But in my recovery, I found out more about God and now I see him. I'm so proud of people in this church 
I know your theology. I'm using that word a lot, but I think because I had this, like, my own reflex. Because when we talk about deep Christianity, it's what people think of. They think of Bible colleges and this and that. And you know what? That's what we, we should learn. Disciples, we should learn. I'm not knocking that. I hope you understand. And, yeah, we should have spiritual disciplines. But the greatest thing is we don't just water leaves. We water the soil. We get to the soil, the things that God put in us. And we can be people like Job. I heard about something, but then I suffered something. So you know what, what James says? Count it all joy when you go through various trials and tribulations. Why? Because that's where you're going to find where God is really all about. Count it all joy. Maybe you can't count right away when you're in the trial. Maybe it's a long count, like one, two years later, three years later. But you learn something about God that you look back and you say, wow, I know this. The other day, I finally, at long last, Heather, I'm going to honor you. So at long last, I read what Heather wrote as a Bible study called Rooted. And I've been saying I was going to read it. i got a long stack of books. I keep buying books, lying to myself that I'm going to read them. I just keep buying books. I guess I like the look of the cover. I keep buying them. But I finally read this. And when I read what Heather wrote about this Bible study, I was like, are you kidding me? Forget about, forget about what other people out, all those national speakers, national speakers. We got somebody in our own church who's been through some trials and some tribulations. And when she came out of them, she got something put in her heart. And she's giving that back to people in the church. Amen. Yeah, we can stand up for that. We got people standing up for that. And I read it, and I was just, oh, it's like, ah, because sometimes Bible studies, I'm like, oh, it's nice. But this one, I was like, come on, Heather, teach me. There's, there's some people, you know, Peter didn't learn really much. He, had, he was walking with Jesus. Blew it. Bad. I, you know, people who knock the Bible, I always think, yeah, but come on, Peter was honest about his life. Like, for me, that's one of the real, for me, I've said this so many times, for me, the evidence of the Bible being so real and so powerful is like Peter saying, and then I cursed God out. Like, he had to write that down because he was being real about how he was. He failed. Like, he cursed God. He was cursing. He was afraid of the servant girl. He was a mess. And then one day on the beach, on the shore, Jesus comes up and starts cooking him fish, making him breakfast. I tell you what. Peter got a deeper relationship through his failures and his recovery and finding out that the love of Jesus, whew, that ain't just something you talk about. That's something that you experience. How many people have experienced the love of Jesus like that? So deep Christians are those who walk through the valley of suffering, found Christ there, and now I got something to say. So I would recommend if you're trying to grow in the light of who God is and in the presence of God, we need more of the presence of God, not just naturally minded Christians who never think twice about who God is and until it comes down to Sunday, but like obsessed with like who Jesus is, that, that we actually ask people who've been there. I think the church could do a whole lot more asking questions than answering them. Ask people who've been there. Oftentimes that somebody who's older. Hey, what, did, what was it like? And older people need to understand when somebody's trying to ask a question to have your problem solved or just to listen to them. I talked about that the other day, just to listen. But that's not always somebody older. Paul said to Timothy, don't let anybody despise you because of your youth. There's some young people in this place who've been through some stuff in a short amount of time that older people stunted their own growth because they stayed in bitterness and unforgiveness. Bitterness and can I just address that for 30 seconds? Bitterness and unforgiveness will put a cap and a lid on the truths that you're supposed to be declaring to other people. As soon as you forgive and let God help you with the bitterness and deal with the bitterness, a fountain of what God has put in you through the hard times can come out. But when you stay locked up in bitterness and you stay locked up in unforgiveness, it's really hard to be inspiring other people in their walks. But guess what? We can have a refresh in this church. We can say, Lord, just heal my heart. I give this to you. And 
people need some light in their lives. Can we agree with that? So those are deeper Christians. The second thing is, deeper Christians are those who step out in faith. We're talking about the presence of God all day long. People who are aware of the presence of God in their lives. Deeper Christians step out in faith in such a way that reliance on God becomes greater than reliance on self. Again, that's easier said than done until you get to a place where you don't have much to rely on in yourself and you got to rely on God. How many people have been there in their lives and have seen God do a deeper work in you? I, I cannot do this on my own. God, I need, and it's not even sometimes like I didn't want to pray this prayer. I was hoping to be able to figure this out on my own. But I didn't, and I couldn't, and I blew it. But God, I'm going to rely on you. Instead of snapping back, instead of worrying about all of this, instead of trying to figure it out, I'm relying on you for something that is bigger than me. There's a, a line in a song that says, I built a, build a boat on sand where they say it never rains. Like Noah with the ark. Build a boat on sand where it doesn't make any sense. How, I, would, I would love to see some people at Castle step out boldly in faith and say, this is kind of scary. This is a big mountain. I don't know how to do this. I've never been there, but I want to grow deeper. I'm going to take two steps. And sometimes it just takes a step. Sometimes the other side of the boat is where all the fish is at. And just taking another step to say, God, I'm going to trust you. And God does something deep in people's lives that are full of faith. We will make mistakes. How many people understand we will make mistakes? Righteousness isn't based on whether we do or not make mistakes. Righteousness, everybody's got to listen to this. Righteousness is based on faith in Christ alone. You can have faith even when you've got mistakes. You can have 100% of Jesus even when you're not 100% yourself, right? So we can have that in him. How about Gideon? You know the story of Gideon? He was the least of all the tribes of Israel. God came to him and said, we got a battle to take care of, an army to take care of, and I'm picking you. And Gideon said, that sounds like a really bad idea. That sounds like a bad choice, God. Uh, how about this? How about this crazy sign that you'll never do, and that way I'm off the hook? God does the sign. And Gideon's like, I guess I'm on the hook. How about I take 30,000 people with me against this army? Not even as much as that army. 30,000 people. How about I do that because I feel better? But then God says, eh, let them go. Let them leave. Let them go. Let them leave. Sometimes you got to let people walk. Let them go. Let them leave. Let them, until it was 300 people. And now God was saying to Gideon, who are you relying on? And Gideon says, I'm going to rely on you. When that happens... When that change happens and you start relying on God like that, then you're going to win some battles. Can we say amen to that? You're going to win some battles. You're going to be like Gideon and be like, okay, I saw a lot of stuff happen, a lot of changes. I didn't know how that was going to work out, but I'm actually, uh, I think I'm going to see God win this battle. And that's what he's calling us to. We are so quick to see the mess. So quick, this is a mess. But you have to remember, in God's presence, this mess, this mess is a miracle. This mess is a chance for God to move in your life in a way that you will not see happen any other way because you have to rely on God. And so in the mess, don't forget to walk in the light of God's presence. Amen? To walk in the light of God's presence and say, if he's with me, who can be against me? If I've got God with me, that army might have tens of thousands. I don't have as many, but I'm trusting my God to overcome and to see a victory. Deep Christians, also they run with focus because they keep Jesus at the center of their lives. Everybody say focus. Here. We lose focus. Anybody ever just feel like, this is the way I want to put it. Anybody ever go through a moment where you just feel like you just spaced out on God like a lie? Can we be honest? Like, that was hours. 
Mm, and you know what that's usually a symptom of? The cares of this world. R self reliance. And not feeding and not watering the soil. Mature, deep Christians praise God and are aware of his presence. How often? What does the scripture say in that verse? All day long. All day long. They're aware of the presence of God. They don't space out. Lu Luis and I, my daughter, we went to Yosemite uh, just this past weekend. In Yosemite, they had this massive granite wall. It's called El Capitan. It goes up 5,000 miles. I don't know how long. It's huge. You drive into this valley, and you're suddenly surrounded by, like, larger-than-life granite walls. And the big one, the big monumental one is El Capitan. It is the place where rock climbers go. And we took these. We, just, we, we, we were climbing our rocks. We're coming in and out of a car. But we see, we see this. And when we came back home, I said, Luisa, years ago, I remember this movie called Free Solo. And Free Solo is this uh, uh, documentary, National Geographic documentary, about... Uh, this man who's the first without any ropes, without any anything else but his fingers and his toes to climb up El Capitan. And I was watching it with Luisa. I was sweating watching this. When I used to work in construction, the guy who I was working for, he would put me, I had to go up on the roofs and he'd be like, it looks like you're going to need to just walk around first. I was like, yes, I do. I need to walk around because I'm scared of these heights. I hated the part where you had to slip back down off the roof onto the scaffolding, and there was like this much between where my feet, and you had to let go and slide down and hit that. Oh, I hated that. I hated that. But I'm a grown adult. I can't be like, can you just hold me and put me down on the scaffolding? I hated it. Heights. This guy was doing, doing this incredible, th he says, but when you... Or in life or death, he says, you focus so much more. He had his grip sometimes was like this. He did this thumb move. I'm going way off on a tangent. I'm just telling you about this move. He did this thumb move where he's got a thumb in the pocket of the groove, and he's got both thumbs, and he's got to do a crossover with his thumb. We could do a whole lot better focusing on God. Amen. Instead of, we wouldn't be spacing out if we realized the moments we take our eyes off Jesus, how dangerous that really is. I need you all to say amen to that. The moment we take deep Christians all day long, they're aware of the presence of God. Not every conversation has to be about God to be in the presence of God. Some of us, it would help if you had a conversation about God because there are people like Tony Nelson who need to hear about the good news. Can we say amen to that? And we need to focus all day long about who Jesus is and be in his presence, and it's possible. I got a little, another quick anecdote, and then we're going to go through something real quick. In the World War II, they had these bombers, World War II. They had four-engine bombers. They could sometimes... The, the engines would get knocked out, and they'd be down to, like, maybe two engines, but they could still do it. They did, they'd say things like, let's just feather it and turn off the gas. That's, that's bizarre, crazy to me, but they were in World War II, and they're fighting like that. But, but when they drop an engine, they lose altitude. And we really, as Christians, need to have all the engines working so we don't lose the altitude so we don't lose our focus, so that we are walking all day long in the light of Jesus who is calling you to stand up like a Gideon, to say sometimes these armies are bigger than you, but you're focused on who God is because you're walking in the presence of the Lord. Can we stand to our feet? I got something really practical to kind of share with you about what this means to walk in God's presence. As the musicians come forward, thank you. How to walk in God's presence this week. I'm going to use some prayers based on Psalm 86. I'm going to go through them. And then let's commit ourselves to being more aware of the presence of God in our lives and walking in the light. How many people right away can say, I just want to walk in God's presence this week and not space out on him like I sometimes do, but stay so focused 
Because I know that when I take my eyes off Jesus, it gets really dangerous. I know how easy it is to kind of just coast and think I'm relying on God, but let's just be honest, I'm relying on myself. But God has called us to something else. So if you looked at Psalm 86, look how ba- this was, the psalmist has a deep relationship with Jesus. A deep relationship. But the prayers, they're not going to blow you away. They, they're ways that keep you in the presence of God. They keep you in the presence of God. And I, it's something that you learn. It's something that you learn. So here's the prayers. If you backed up in Psalm, Psalm 86, here's the prayers. Lord, I turn to you because I need your help. Can we say amen to that prayer? If you want to grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus, all day long, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I'm relying on you. One slip. I feel like but God's grace isn't like that. He's not. But Lord, help me. Second prayer. We're going to say amen at the end of them. Lord, protect me and preserve my faith. So let me just reiterate that. When you want to walk in the light of God's presence, so much darkness. The man I just talked to who climbed El Capitan, he started one of his, his climbs in the dark, but he had a helmet with the light on it. Because even in darkness, you need light. And especially in darkness, you need light. And so, Lord, protect me all day long. Pres- increase my faith. Preserve my faith. Become aware of them. Third one. Lord, fill me with your joy as I put my trust in you. Ah, you know, I know. I know that not every moment of our lives is just happy. But God can fill us with joy as we put our trust in him. We have a weapon to fight the darkness in this world. Here's another prayer. You want to... Right? We still want to walk with Jesus all day long. In this prayer, it says, Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. Oh, one of the deepest prayers you can pray is not about what I'm trying to get. It's what he already did. It's not what I'm trying to earn. It's what he already fought for and won on the cross. And I'm telling you, that is one of the, that's, that's a favorite prayer for me. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. Because what it does, it doesn't make me feel like I want to mess up again. What it does, it makes me feel like, Lord, just, I feel the power of God in my life. Because forgiveness brings power into your otherwise powerless life. Lord, in moments of distress, I ask you for peace. Can we all say amen? Say amen. In moments of distress, I ask for your peace all day long. This is a stressed out society. Lord, you could pray this. You could pray this coming into church. You could pray these prayers, short prayers that keep you connected to God Almighty. Lord, moments, I'm stressed. I need your peace. Next. Lord, I declare there is no one like you. For me, it ain't Jesus and something else. I don't want to mix the water with any other liquids. It's Jesus. The gospel, it's the best story because it's a true story. And he's high above any other God. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And every now and then in the middle of your day, you just need to declare with some real faith, Lord, there is no one like you. I don't need to go here to get my fill. I don't need to go there to get my fill. I don't even need to have a person next to me right now because, Lord, there is no one like you. Lord, Give me a teachable and faithful heart that relies on you. Can you say amen? Give me, oh, we need a lot more Christians with teachable hearts. 
We don't need more Christians who already learned all, all there is to learn. I've done a lot of unlearning in my own life. A lot of preconceived ideas about God that were passed to me that wasn't God. I'm not afraid to say that. That, just, that, that wasn't God. But Lord, give me a teachable heart. Jesus said to, to the people around him, you, ha- you heard it said, but I tell you. You've been hearing this this whole time, but you heard it from the, you heard it from people who didn't get it. And I tell you, you one of the things you, as you grow in the presence of God, you learn to hear His voice. You actually do. You can. You could be like, hmm, that sounds like Jesus. And I declare there is no one like you. Give me teachable, faithful heart. Two more. Lord, I declare that you are compassionate and gracious towards me. I mean, sometimes I need to do this, Lord. Because this, this world is not compassionate. Can we agree? Like, there could be people who are kind and ethical, but compassionate when you don't do what they think you should have done. Lord, I declare you are compassionate and gracious toward me. And then finally, here's a big prayer to be walking all day long in the presence of God. Lord, show me your goodness so that you might be glorified in my life. Amen. Amen. It's, it's okay. It's okay to ask God to show you his goodness. It's okay. Some of you have been such a bad idea of who God is. He's just here to punish. He wants to bless. He's not here just to kind of catch you on something. He's not up in the sky with his arms folded. He's full of what? Compassion and mercy. He's full of love and he's gracious. And sometimes the boldest thing you could do throughout your day, I'm at work, I'm in the home, I'm driving, I'm on Route 12, I'm at Target, I'm at Dunkin' Donuts, I'm not going to give away my whole week schedule. Whatever it is, I can say sometimes, Lord, show me your goodness so that other people can see that you're good to me so that you would be glorified. That's a good prayer. All right, let's all pray together. And you know, this is not a repeat prayer, but let's just, Lord, I, I commit myself and I'm sure if you, that this is you, you want to walk in the presence of God, let's do that. We could just raise our hands for this week. Lord, I want to be more aware of you this coming week than I was the last week. And I want to be a type of Christian who gets deeper in my relationship by being mindful of you all day long. Help me. Forgive me, strengthen me, preserve me, keep me. And Lord, when we pray those prayers, you know that they often will turn into, Lord, help them, forgive them, strengthen them, bless my daughter, bless my wife, bless my family, strengthen those I work with, even the ones I don't like to work with. But Lord, I pray your hand will be upon the people around me. That's what it means to be a deeper Christian. Lord, may this church mature. This week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You speak and waters crash upon the sand The oceans push and pull at your command You hold the moon and stars within your hands And all with just a breath the world begins Let me sing that verse again Seek and waters crash upon the sand. The oceans push and pull at your command. You hold the moon and stars within your hands. And all with just a breath, the world begins. Sing God, the 
there's nobody like you God there's nobody like you God and there will never be when nothing we could do would be Heaven's highest place you reach for us. My sin and shame forever overcome. The grave was overwhelmed by perfect love. When we sing, God, there's nobody like you, God. There's no nobody like you, God, and there will never be. God, there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody like you, God, and there will never be.
Nobody like you, God, and there. 